The House of Dystrier, Chapter 10, Part 1 It's the same, Thomas said. I knew it would be. I knew it had to be the same. Standing in the vestibule, he felt so glad it hadn't changed. He recalled a time not too long ago when he and his father had spent a quiet talking week together, camping in the hills and pines back home. He could remember details of the nights and days of that week, how the woods had seemed smoky and close because there had been so little rain. When they were not hunting for their food, he and his father lay low under the pines, where the air was almost pure. Close to the ground, where the earth smelled so sweet, Thomas never wanted to let go of the fallen pine needles. His father had talked and talked. Later, when Thomas tried to recall what his father had said, he couldn't. But now it came, in t came to him in snatches. May I talk to you about it, son? Our African church, the Negro church. I can yield to its separateness when I realize that without it segregated, there would be no story of the Underground Railroad. There would be no sure refuge for the exhausted runaway slave. That's the past, Thomas had told him. That's no reason for the way it is now. Through part of history, behind time or ahead of its time, it always reveals men strong enough to lead us out of the trap of any time. Go down Moses. The singing of that was forbidden. Think of it. Then it was sung by a whole nation. Who sings it today? Thomas had said. Nobody listens. Great grandmother stopped going to church even before the last minister left us. It's all over, Papa. You can argue, Thomas. I don't blame you. You young get stifled by its lecture and renegade Jesus. I won't deny its nar narrowness. But do you remember the Sunday school? I don't remember any of it. The boys and girls? Oh, yes, I remember how we would laugh, how we would cut up when we got tired of the lecture. And yes, I remember the ladies, those ladies in white who would always volunteer to teach you, his father had said. They could talk so about Jesus until he never was a man. And the moonlight picnics, I remember them, Papa. And the hayrides, what did they have to stop? Why did they have to stop? Where did they go to? Yes, you remember, Thomas. That's all I mean. The church is our treasure, son, our own true chance. And we are all the luck it has. Maybe so, thought Thomas. The far-off voice faded out of his mind. Maybe not. He stood calmly, waiting to enter the small and stifling church. It sure does feel good to be here, though. It sure feels like home. Mac Darrow was seated at the piano, playing quiet chords as the church members entered. Thomas wasn't surprised at all on seeing him there at the piano. Maybe it was true what his father had said about remembering the church. For slowly, he recalled there had been a boy about the manner and size of Mac Darrow a long time ago. He came when the last preacher came, Thomas thought. Yes, he was the preacher's own boy. He had a big new piano, and he didn't like us little kids touching it. But we would sneak into the church and touch it. We loved it so. I remember I did that. He caught me and told me, and he told Papa, and he never spoke to me after that. Why is it bad boys bigger than me always play the piano so well, Thomas wondered. Why can't they sit back and be content with being bad and big? Like Thomas, Mac Darrow, Mac Darrow wore a dark suit. It wasn't a new suit, Thomas could tell, but it was a good suit and quite all right for Sunday. Darrow wore a black tie. He had on black shoes that had a hard, high gloss. He doesn't, lo he doesn't look like the same boy, Thomas thought. No, not at all. No, not at all like that boy hanging on to the black's tail. As though sensing some stir in the congregation, Mac Darrow turned away from the piano toward the vestibule. He didn't look at Mr. and Mrs. Small nor at the twins. He looked at Thomas, and his hands never stopped moving over the piano keys. There was a playful flicker in his side as he recognized Thomas. Next, he looked almost afraid of something, but then that, too, was gone. That's all right, Thomas thought. He accepted the fact that there were certain things you didn't do in church. Even the most comic boy wouldn't laugh or make fun of it. Even the worst boy would not set flame to it, as some white boys had done at home. When the last preacher and his son began holding night meetings, to his mind, making fun and setting flame were degrees of the same evil.